Hello everyone, welcome back to our online stream. We're so happy to have you join in once again this week. I hope that you can use this time to really focus in the word and worship, set everything aside, open up your Bible and get together with your family and tune into what we have for you this week. Before I pray, I'd like to read uh, a few verses that I was reading during this week from Romans chapter 11. This is gonna be verse 33 to 36. It goes like this. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I want to call us this morning to remember that God is in control of everything. Despite not being able to gather once again one more week, we know that God has a plan. We see that God has his promises, that God has his wisdom and knowledge that we, are, we can't even search. And so I'd like to pray with this attitude of coming to God and humbling ourselves that he is the giver and author of life. He, at the end of the day, knows at all times of what's going on, and he has a bigger plan. So let us pray. Dear Lord God, we come to you this morning, and we want to praise you and glorify you through our worship, through reading of your word, through reflecting on your promises, God. We believe that you have this um, eternal wisdom, this, these deep riches that we can't even imagine, God, that you are always in control, that you deserve all the glory and you have all the power, and that we need to rely and trust in your name, God. Help us understand this truth and reflect on it as we approach this service. We ask you to bless this time. Amen. Good morning, church. I want to invite you all to join us as we praise the Lord, the Almighty. The Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear now to His temple draw near, praise Him in glad next song, I want to read a passage from Psalm 18, verse 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, 
my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Let us just focus on our Lord Jesus Christ and how he is our solid rock that we can rely on. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. See from wrath and me. for your grace and love for us, Lord, that we can rely on your salvation. We can rely on you because you are the solid rock, the rock of ages that we can build our life upon and have full security without doubt. Lord, we thank you so much for this assurance that we have in you, Lord. Um, Let us just praise you for everything, Lord. Um, we, We praise you for your son, Jesus Christ, for the perfect sacrifice on that cross, on Calvary's cross that saved us from all sins and gave us eternal life, Lord. Let us always worship and praise your name forever and ever. In your name we pray, amen. Again, welcome everyone to our English service this um, morning, I guess you're watching it this morning. I want to make several announcements uh, before we go on uh, to worship our God and hear his word. First of all, beginning with next Sunday, June, sorry, May 17th, we will be able to gather in person, and we are aware that PA Governor, Governor Wolf, suggested that uh, we stay at home until June the 4th, Um, and if you don't feel comfortable coming in person, please don't come, stay home. We don't want anyone to act against or... um, not in accordance with their conscience. 
but those of you who feel comfortable coming and will use all the safety precautions needed, uh, you're welcome to come in person. Again, we don't expect many people, but I'm excited to have at least some people here and to have that fellowship here as a church. I can't wait for that moment. Uh, again, just to remind you, we will practice all safety precautions. We will have everyone will be asked to wear a mask except the preaching people and those on the stage. Um, also, we will be asking you to not interact closer. Uh, you have to keep that distance in between. Also, um, you have to park in the back of a building next three Sundays at least and uh, enter through the gym door and practice social distancing in the church, in this building. And we have those marks, those uh, post-it notes, and make sure you sit where uh, it is designated so that we don't have anyone close, close to another person. And also, we would uh, encourage people to get tested. I got tested yesterday. I got the, the results today, which is really fast, 24 hours it took. And I'm negative. Just to let you know. Um, but I went back to the hospital and I went back into COVID rooms, so I don't know, maybe I'm not. But just, uh, I want to encourage you to get tested so that you know that you are not a threat to anyone. And if you are, you will be isolating yourself and uh, practice all those precautions that they suggest us. Again, we are not rebelling. We are just want to practice our right for fellowship and we are not disobeying in gathering 10, 15, 20, or 30 people. Our ministry is small. We don't have any um, fear that we will have more than 50 people anyway. And I think our building uh, can easily uh, fit 50 people socially distanced. So um, again, if you, are, if you feel comfortable, please come. That's the major announcement. The second announcement is uh, today we have a speaker our beloved Paul Bass, he'll be preaching to us on God's holiness, uh, his encouragement to me. And um, I just want to remind you that one of the purposes of this ministry is for us to invest in young men and young women. We want to invest in young men and young women, build them up in the faith of the gospel so that they may influence other people. The young men influence on more public scale. Young women will influence kids and families and uh, other women. So um, it's a joy to see young men step up and preach the word of God and are called by God to do this work. And I want all of us to pray. Pray for young men. Pray for young women. Also look for young men and young women to invest in them to spend your life by investing your time, your resources in building someone up in the faith of the gospel, getting them closer to Jesus so that they may be used by God in a powerful way. Many people are very unknown in church history, but they invested in a person who is very well known. They had that impact, and, uh, and that's the joy that we can all experience. We don't have to be Spurgeons and and MacArthur's, we can just be a normal, ordinary preacher, but by faithfully investing in individuals, we can make a great impact for the gospel. So we're excited to hear from Paul, but also I don't want to miss today, tomorrow, but today, technically, <laughs> live streams on Sunday, uh, is the Mother's Day, and uh, please, all of you who are part of English service, and you're young, make sure you call your mom, or visit your mom, Therese, don't forget. <laughs> um, happy Mother's Day to all mothers or future mothers. And I just want to, again, just a little bit, to take some time to refocus our attention on the importance of motherhood. We have only one upcoming mother here present. So, um, but I am just trying to myself remember, remind myself of the importance of motherhood and what a high calling it is for a woman to be a mother. This is what the Bible says, just two verses. 1 Timothy 5.14, Therefore I want younger widows, or just women in general, to get married, bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach. Titus 2.4, He's, he is admonishing older women to teach 
and so to train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working and at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Uh, these, are, these two verses are a great reminder for all of us, especially for younger women, that this is the highest calling, to be a wife and to be a mother and to have that impact on children. A man will never have that impact on children as the wife will have, as the mother has. Um, and that's, that's the amazing design of God, how God planned it this way. Let me just read you a couple of quotes from godly men about their mothers. Just listen to this. Charles Spurgeon, a preacher of, in 19th century, the, the prince of preachers. This, this is what he says about the motherhood. You are as much serving God in looking after your own children and training, training them up in God's fear and minding the house and making your household a church for God as you would be if you had been called to lead an army to battle for the Lord of hosts. Another quote, I'm sure that in my early youth, no teaching ever made such an impression upon my mind as the instruction of my mother. C.S. Lewis, a writer in 20th century, wrote the following, the homemaker has the ultimate career. All other careers exist for one purpose only, and that is to support the ultimate career. John Wesley, the preacher of 17th century, said the following, I learned more Christianity, more about Christianity from my mother than from all the theologians in England. Charles Hodge, a preacher and a seminary professor, he was a great man of God, he said the following, to our mother, my brother and myself under God owe absolutely everything. To us, she devoted her life. For us, she prayed, labored, and suffered. And I want to end by telling a story, a story about a man. His name is J. Gresham Machen. He was a powerful man of God. God used him to transfer the seminary from Princeton Seminary to Westminster Seminary, where Pastor Benjamin goes to school. But God used him to, to uh, found this seminary, Westminster, because Princeton Seminary went liberal. They denied all the core doctrines of Christianity. And this man stood up and said, we cannot do this. This is liberal. We have to fight for the truth. And they took the gospel, took the truth, and the professors, some of the professors, and they uh, crossed the river, and they found the seminary in Philadelphia. It's called Westminster Seminary. It exists still today, and it's still faithful seminary. This is what he says. When he became a, young, when he became a Christian, when he was young, he was doubting his salvation. And he had those dark moments when he didn't know if he's saved or not. And his mom taught him how to rest on Christ. These are her words. My mother spoke to me in those dark hours when the lamp burned dim, when I thought that faith was gone and shipwreck has been made of my soul. Christ, she used to say, keeps firmer hold on us then we keep on him. His mom built him up in the faith of the gospel so firmly that he was able to impact seminary and through seminary a new generation of preachers. Impact of one woman, of her faith in Jesus. So I encourage all of our people to really value motherhood. And sometimes it's fine to quit a job. And I think I would encourage people to quit jobs and to focus on motherhood. It's the highest calling under heaven for a wife, for a girl, for a wife, for a mother. If you are um, employed and you're able to give, you're able to give, uh, go to lifewaybc.org um, and uh, you'll be able to give there, donate online. And we'll be praying for our offering as well. May God bless you and let's pray and we'll also bless the offering. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Christ, only claiming him, his righteousness, his death on the cross for us. 
Lord, we acknowledge that we are sinners. We acknowledge, Lord, that we are saved only by the blood of your Son and by his perfect life that is imputed to us. Lord, and we acknowledge, Lord, that we are still battling our sin. We want to be holy. We want to be pure. We want to be like your Son, Jesus. And one day we will be. And as we will be hearing today, Lord, we want that holiness. We want to be godly. And we pray that you would help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to discipline ourselves, to buffet our body, to punch our flesh, and to become more and more like Christ. And in that pursuit of holiness, to find joy and happiness. Bless our people, Lord, especially during this time of isolation and loneliness, Lord. We don't want to fall in sin in our previous habits that we um, had before we became Christians. Bless our people and sanctify us and help us, Lord, to fight the, the fight with sin and to pursue holiness. As, as we will be hearing today about your holiness, Lord, help us to recover that attitude of awe and wonder and worship and ter being terrified of who you are, O oh God. How great are you? How majestic are you? How holy and sovereign you are? And so often we forget how great you are and that's why we fall in sin and we don't trust you and we just live a life that's not pleasing to you help us lord and bless our people we also pray lord for our current situation that we find ourselves in we pray for the, we pray for the governing authorities that we, you that you would give them wisdom that you would give them much grace uh, to make those decisions lord as well as to not prolong this quarantine if it's not necessary we pray that you'd Give them wisdom, Lord, and um, we pray that you also bless us as we will start to gather. Protect us, Lord, from all the things that can happen to us as we are gathering in person. And we pray that you would uh, protect us from this illness, protect our church, especially our elders uh, and those who are immunocompromised. Please keep, keep them in your hands, keep them safe. We also pray that you would bless our leaders, give them wisdom, Lord, as we are beginning uh, to gather in person. Uh, give us grace, Lord, and give us passion for you, Lord, and bless us. We need you, and we need your wisdom, and we need your help, we need your grace, and we need, Lord, to uh, decide some, to make some important decisions in upcoming weeks, and we pray that you would help us. In Christ's name I pray, amen.
church. It is a pleasure to be back here again. And by the grace of God, we have gathered here together to once again listen to the Word of God. And as, as a, it was mentioned earlier already, that today I wanted to talk to you guys about holiness. And when we read the Bible, we see numerous times how the word holiness uh, appears in connection with God. Holy is what God is. And it is not merely just an attribute of God, but it is the essence of God. It is who God is. And because of His holiness, we see that those different attributes like love and mercy are so greatly distinct from everything else. It is not merely to say that God's holiness is more than His love or more than His mercy, but it is to say that because God is holy, He is love. And because He is holy, He is merciful. And because He is holy, His wrath is holy as well. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to just go through some of the passages in the Bible and just take a look at how God's holiness is revealed through certain passages and highlight His holiness. And mainly I wanted to first look at holiness of God in creation and how we can see that through His perfect and His supreme wisdom and righteousness and how He creates everything in a certain order. Uh, also how God's holiness, he cannot dwell among sin. In his holiness, he is too holy for sin. He abhors sin, and sin has, he cannot dwell among a holy God. And finally, I want to take a look at the holiness of God in the person of Jesus Christ. So before we start, I just want to give a definition of holiness so that we have a perspective of how we see things. And the way I define holiness is that holiness is total perfection, in all areas of a being, that which sets him apart and infinitely distinct from everything else. So once again, holiness is total perfection in all areas of a being, that which sets him apart and infinitely distinct from everything else in this world. When we begin to read Genesis chapter 1, we see that in this first chapter, what God is doing, he is creating the world, the current world that we live in right now. But before it became what it is right now, we see that in his wisdom and in his holiness, he creates everything in an orderly way. Although we don't see the word holiness in the first chapter, the first time we really see the word holiness is in Exodus chapter 3, verse 5, when Moses sees the burning bush and he walks towards it, and the Lord says to him, Moses, Moses, take off your sandals for the feet which you for the ground which you stand on is holy. But in this first chapter, we see that God's holiness is displayed in his creation. And like the psalmist says, O Lord, how many are your works? In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. We see his holiness in pure righteousness of how everything that he makes is morally upright. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds, and how in all these deeds he is perfect and his perfection is in his creation. And so we see that the Lord, he creates the heaven and earth. The earth itself was formless and he gives it form. 
With his words, he creates everything that is on this planet today. And we see that further on as we read in the first chapter, verses 11, it says that God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plant yield seeds, and fruit and trees of the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them, and it will sow. Every single plant was distinct from every other plant. In a certain order, with no malfunctioning, everything had to create its own offspring, and it was distinct from everything else without any mistake. Meaning that if you were to take an apple and take a seed out of an apple and place it into the ground, what would happen is after a while, it would spring out an apple tree, not a tomato. Even in the simplest form, we see that something like that creates an offspring that is similarly identical to it itself. And for us, maybe nowadays, we don't really notice these things because we don't really study things in depth. Uh, if you have a biologist nowadays, when they look at certain uh, genotypes of different plants and they see how the DNA of every single cell is so unique in a way that it is so different from everything else. A specific genotype gives a specific desired phenotype. Moreover, we see that God, he creates living creatures on the planet. And as we continue to read in Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 to 25, we read the following. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Once again, notice the words, after their kind. There was no distortment in how God created these creatures. Everything had its own purpose. Just like the sky and the sun, which gave the morning light and supplied the plants and everything on the earth, in the same way the moon and the stars gave a specific light in the nighttime, everything worked together for a specific purpose. Everything was right. And we see that God creates man and woman with unique anatomy. If you look at yourself right now, you see how everything is so symmetrical, how everything has a distinct uh, body part that works for a specific reason. Everything functions in an orderly way. And this was very good in the eyes of the Lord. Everything was morally upright. A man was created and a woman was created for him. Because together in those two creations, we see perfect unity and harmony within these two individuals. And once again, God looked at his creation and he said, that is very good. His creation, we see, speaks of his holiness because of the way it is created. In his perfect wisdom, in his perfectly moral and righteous mind, without any corruption. Yet we see that sin, it enters into the world through one man, Adam, and corruption enters as well. And it didn't take too long for us to notice how everything multiplied in lawlessness and sin. If you take a look at chapter 6, we'll see in verse 5 of uh, Genesis, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Every single thought of man at that point multiplied to a a specific and a certain way of sin, just thinking sin the whole time. And the Lord sees that, and he sees that man is completely corrupt and different from his holy being. And we see that God, he cannot dwell in sin. His holiness, it abhors sin. It repels sin like antibodies in your body that fight away certain infections. Many people can say that God is God of, God of love or God of mercy, but we forget that God and his love and mercy are rooted inside his holiness. And that because he is holy, his love has to be the right type of love. 
It cannot be the worldly type of love that we think about or the type of um, mercy or justice that we desire. God has a certain standard, and because he is holy, his law needs to be the way he desired for it to be. His holiness cannot be belittled by our sin. And so, because of that, even though we might think that Adam and Eve sinned as such a small sin, God couldn't just sweep it under the rug. But he had to have them leave this beautiful garden which he created with total perfection until sin has entered through one man, Adam. And because of sin, the wages of sin are death. Many of us might think that God is just some kind of a man who looks at a kid misbehave and in a way just looks at him and winks and pretends like nothing has happened, but that's just not how God works. Habakkuk in chapter 1 verse 13 says, your eyes are too pure to approve evil and you cannot look at wickedness with favor. He's just way too holy and wickedness in his eyes is just a disgust. He can't look at it and approve it or pretend like he never seen it because he is just way too holy. It was the holiness of God that when he led Israel out of Egypt, he told Moses that because of their great sin and because of their stubbornness, he was not able to walk before them. As we read in Exodus chapter 33, verses 2 to verses 3, we read these following words. The Lord speaks to Moses and he says, I will send an angel before you and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey and I will not go up in your midst because you are an obstinate people and I will destroy you on the way. We see that numerous times God shows his great mercy and his great glory to Israel as he's leading them through the wilderness. In times where they needed food, he provides them with food. In times where they are in need of protection, he shows them that protection. He shows them his compassion. He reveals his glory so many times. But for some reason, they still are stubborn. And their stubbornness does not vanish. No matter what God was doing, they were still stubborn. And so if God was in their midst, their stubbornness would have totally provoked him to anger, to his holy anger which he has to unleash on those who are sinful. There's just no way that he can look at it and pretend like it never happened. The holiness of God is not something to be taken lightly. And many of us might remember the story of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu. We know that God chooses Aaron and his sons, and he consecrates them to be the priests of the nation of Israel. They were supposed to wear specific clothes that were distinct from every single person in that nation for they were priests that would go before the Lord in the Holy of Holies and atone for the people and first and foremost would atone for their own sin for they were sinners as well. And we read the story in Leviticus chapter 10 verses 1 to 3. What happens when Nadab and Abihu show no reverence for the Lord, but profane his holy name and totally disregard his commands. You read the following. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their prospective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out of the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron, therefore, kept silent. We see that those two priests in the previous chapters, they beheld the glory of God. They were there with the 70 elders with Aaron, with Moses, worshiping the Lord, and they seen his appearance, and the pavement under his feet was like sapphire, as clear as sky. But because of their foolishness, because of their arrogance, they defiled the Holy of Holies by coming in there under the influence of wine, 
and showing no reverence to the Lord, the Holy of Holies, whose name cannot be profaned, who acts for his glory, and who shows righteous wrath on those who do not abide under his holiness. We see that it is the holiness of God that truly makes the sinfulness of man clear. And Isaiah was truly one of those people who saw that and, and realized his sinfulness within him. We read this in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe to me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew, flew to me with a burning coal in his hands, which he had taken from the altar with tongues. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. It was this vision of the Lord that Isaiah saw right before becoming the prophet of the Lord. When Uzziah, the tenth king of Judah, being 16 years of age, became king. He reigned for 52 years, and he was truly a good king in the beginning. We see that he trusts the Lord. He doesn't turn neither to the left or to the right. He obeys his commands, his law, and the Lord blesses him. But yet, at the end of his reign, pride overtakes him. And this pride completely ruins him as a king. And God strikes him with leprosy, and for the last few um, for the last few moments of his life, he had to live completely isolated from all the people. And at this year, we see that Uzziah is a king. He dies. And what happens when a good king like this dies? What happens to the people, the nation, who hears of this news? And, of course, some might be grieving. Some might be in great panic. But now look what Isaiah sees. He sees the Lord in his holiness sitting on a throne high and lifted up in total composure, totally calm. The train of his glorious robe is filling the temple. It's long and beautiful, leaving you in awe and out of your seat, just like a bride who walks down the aisle. We see that seraphim, these creatures who are constantly in the presence of the Lord with unique anatomy, and they have six wings with two, which they cover their feet, not showing any exposure and their creatureness. With two, they cover their face for the holiness of God is something that they cannot stare into because it penetrates them straight through. And with two, they fly. More than that, they emphasize these words and say, holy, holy, holy. Stressing the holiness of God. Stressing the essence of the Lord and who he truly is within his true nature, and that shows his glory in everything else. We see that the seraphim, they don't emphasize that he is mercy, 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 or that he's love, 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 but they say that he is holy, 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 and that these things cause Isaiah to look at it himself and, and see how sinful he is as a man. Maybe in his time, at that time, he was truly a righteous man, and many might have uh, thought of him as the most righteous man in the land, but when he sees this glorious vision of the Lord and his holiness, he realizes that his righteousness has no weight. And he says, woe to me, for I am ruined. Why is he ruined? Because someone so sinful like man cannot see the holiness of God and remain alive. And Isaiah was aware of that once Seeing that this is the true holiness of the Lord that leaves speechless those who behold it 
And we see it throughout the whole Bible how the glory of the Lord would appear and those who would see it would be frightened because how can a sinful man be in the presence of a holy God and behold his glory? Truly, the holiness of God, it shows the sinfulness of man. And something that I wanted to stress next is that we see the holiness of Christ when um, we begin to read the New Testament. And another thing that I wanted to stress is that if it wasn't for God's holiness, then there would be no gospel. There would be no purpose of Christ's incarnation, his crucifixion, and his resurrection because it was only on the basis of Jesus' holy life that we can be saved, that we could be reconciled with the Father and have eternal life through him, only because of Christ. We see that Jesus, he had a unique birth. It wasn't just like any other man. The angel of the Lord, he appears to Mary and he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Jesus was the only man who can be in the company of adulterers, tax collectors, and demon-possessed men and still walk out without any sin. In fact, his holiness was what changed those people. His holiness was reigning supreme. And the demons who saw Jesus, they acknowledged his holiness. When Jesus was teaching in the temple, we see that the demons hearing him speak, they say, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Mark chapter 1, verses 24. It was clear that Jesus wasn't just an ordinary person. And uh, when Jesus' disciples were with him and caught a storm at the sea, perishing, they woke Jesus up and said, Lord, do you not care for us? We're perishing. How come you're sleeping and so calm? And the Lord, waking up, rebuking the wind, completely caused the sea to stay calm. And the wind as well, to which his disciples became even more frightened and said, who is this man that even the winds and sea obey him? Who is this man, this holy man, that even nature, the forces that hear his voice, tremble at his voice? There was no one like our Lord Jesus. When teaching a huge crowd at the lake of Gennesaret, we see that Jesus steps into Peter's boat, and after he finished teaching, he tells Peter, go out into the lake, go out into the deep and cast down your nets. To which Peter, a skilled fisherman that he was, in his distress after fishing all night, says, Master, we were, at, we were fishing all night and we caught nothing. And I don't think it's even going to work, but by your word, I will do and let down the nets. To his surprise, they caught a great quantity of fish and they needed an extra boat to come help them. And uh, Peter, seeing this great miracle, he fell down at Jesus' feet and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Peter clearly knew that this was not a coincidence, coincidental catch. He's been fishing all night and didn't catch anything. Yet, for some reason, when the Lord tells him to cast down his net, he gets a huge quantity of fish. And he realizes, fear seizes Peter because he was a sinful man before a holy Christ. Holy Christ. The one who didn't commit any sin. Sin had nothing on Jesus because he was completely Pure. He was the holy lamb of God that took away sins of those who believe unto his name. He was completely righteous, perfect, sinless son of God. No one could have lived a perfect life like Jesus, but God did what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law will be fulfilled in us, in those who believe unto his holy name. The righteousness of Christ is in us. This is what saves us. His righteousness is what saves us because he was able to live a completely righteous life. And he died on our behalf. And his life proved 
that we in him could have eternity. That by his righteousness imputed into us, counted for us, we have this reconciliation with the Father. I have eternal life in him. Jesus speaking to the multitudes after he fed the 5,000 standing before the people, he said, and he emphasized this, truly, truly I say unto you, whoever believes has eternal life. Whoever believes unto Christ, the Son of God, who lived this perfect life, holy life, has eternal life. And the question for us today and for you, dear listener, is do you strive for holiness? Or is holiness just a foreign concept to you that you only hear maybe once in a while or a, a preacher preach, but you really don't let that grip your heart? You don't really think about these things because, you know, it's not for you. Christian, what about you? And how do you see your life? We are called to be holy. First Peter chapter 115, Peter writes and calls us to be holy in all our con conduct. Why? Because the one who saved us, the one who called us is holy. Now, this does not mean that you could ever become sinless here on earth by your earthly bodies. But do you hate the idea of sin? Do you hate the idea of living in sin all your life? Or do you just give in to it and, and just live it because it's just easier for you? Or do you hate it? Do you want to fight against it? Do you want freedom from it? Do you want this holiness? Do you strive for it? The Christian life is truly a life of repentance because we take two steps forward and take a step back in everything that we do, but we trust Christ in our salvation. And we trust in him that he will lead us to the end. We strive for the holiness to which he called us because he is holy. Apostle Paul, he writes, Wretched man that I am, who can save me from this body of sin? Dear friend, Jesus is the only one who can save you from this body of sin. And if you are not in Christ today, then know that you are perishing. Know that today is the day of salvation. Today is the opportunity to humble yourself before a holy God. For he gives you this time right now to repent. And uh, as we have time to pray in a little bit, think about your life. Think about how you're living it and think about a holy God against who you sin, against whose name you profane with your sin. By no means, sinner, you will not be punished unless you humble yourself under the righteous hand of Christ. Let us pray. Dear Lord, righteous and holy God, we come before you right now, and I stand before you, Lord, knowing that you are holy, knowing that there is no one like you and that your holiness is cannot tolerate sin, Lord. Those who sin against you, Lord, don't realize this and they are perishing unless they call upon the name of Christ. The name of Christ which washes away all sins and whose righteousness is counted for us, Lord, because he lived this perfect life. He was holy without sin. He was unable to sin. In all his ways, he showed that he loved you, Lord, that his love was real and that he died on the cross for, for our sins in our place. Lord, uh, I pray for those who do not know you and who are still far away. Lord, there is no salvation only in you alone. Lord, nothing else can save a man, only your holy and righteous name, Jesus. And I pray for those who are currently struggling, who are maybe in sin and, and fight it, but still fall into it, Lord, you know those people, and Lord, I know that you can help, and Lord, you free those who are in you, you free those who are in sin, and they are no longer slaves to sin, they are alive in you, they have freedom in you, Jesus, remind them of this so that they can trust in you and fight their sins and strive for holiness without which we will not see you, Lord. We are in need of you in every single aspect of our life, Lord. And I pray that you bless the people and may your name be glorified in all things. Amen.
Fall on my God, fall on me. 